For 11 of the last 15 years, Michael Jackson has been the highest paid dead celebrity. <laughs> Only seven people have held that title since Forbes started tracking the numbers. I know you want to know who's on the list. It's a surprising list, I admit it. Elvis Presley, he used to always get it until MJ kicked off and now he hasn't gotten to the top since then, but uh, Elvis Presley, Kurt Cobain, Michael Jackson, Elizabeth Taylor, Yves Saint Laurent, Roald Dahl, and J.R.R. Tolkien. He took it a couple of years ago. Of course, these earnings are no longer paid to the celebrities themselves. Obviously, they have left this world and its trappings behind. Their earthly riches have no impact on their eternal destinies. We use that term trappings sometimes, the trappings of fame, the trappings of power, the trappings of wealth. In Ecclesiastes 5, in the section we're in tonight, the teacher points out that wealth can often be a literal trap for us, a dangerous obsession and addiction that leaves its victims tired, worried, and cheated, robbed of what is truly good in life. The teacher means to horrify us with his discovery tonight. When he shows it to us, he twice calls it a sickening tragedy a serious, severe, grievously evil problem we are faced with in this world. In a true sense, he brings us into the bathroom floor of Graceland, into the greenhouse above the garage in Seattle, Washington. Brings us to go look at the hot tub overlooking the coast in the Pacific Palisades. It's not just a problem we observe affecting others, the celebrities of the world. It's one that almost all of us are susceptible to on one level or another. Bible commentator Philip Ryken writes, most Americans have at least a mild case of a deadly disease called affluenza. I thought that was clever. Which is an unhealthy relationship with money or the pursuit of wealth. Uh, it's a serious problem, so serious and so widespread that the teacher spends a lot of time warning us about it. But not just the teacher, so does the book of Proverbs. And so did Jesus, who warned us that a focus on material success, an obsession with worldly wealth, will destroy our lives and will destroy our relationship with God himself. So let's take a look at this. We're going to begin in verse 8 and see how the pursuit of riches first damages a society at large. Verse 8, if you see oppression of the poor and perversion of justice and righteousness in the province, don't be astonished at the situation because one official protects another official and higher officials protect them. Human governments, no matter what form they take, will inevitably be corrupted. That's just the deal. While some forms, of course, tend to be less corrupt than others, don't get me wrong, not all forms are equal. I certainly don't want to live in certain forms of human government that have been tried before. But be that as it may, there is no magic formula that protects a populace from the sin nature of the individuals in government. It's foolish to think that we will solve the problem of a corrupted heart through laws or regulations or systems or checks and balances. Now, those things can help, absolutely. But the teacher reveals a sad truth here. In any form, whether it's democracy or republic or dictatorship or commonwealth or monarchy or weird cult in the middle of the jungle, no matter what the form is, there will inevitably be justice and oppression in one form or another. Why? Because human beings are corrupted and we're trapped in this system under the sun. That's what this book is about. Now, as Christians who understand God's principles and, uh, and his desire for justice and righteousness and the well-ordered society, we shouldn't just be numb to oppression. We shouldn't just be numb to injustice and unrighteousness at the societal level. And Clearly, from the teachings of both the Old and New Testament, we should do what we can to assist the oppressed, to fight for those who have been denied justice, to rescue those in need. We agree with that. But don't think for one minute that we are going to be able to solve every societal problem by arranging society in a certain way. How many utopias have been attempted? How many colonies? How many you know, communes, how many, you know, perfect societies. They all end in tragedy. They all end in misery. 
And don't think for one minute that one candidate or two will rid our society of all the bad actors around us. It just can't. They can't do it. Human society is constantly fighting a losing battle against human nature. It's a fight we cannot win. That's the point of the gospel. You can't win the fight against your sin nature on your own. You need a savior to rescue you from it. The teacher says here, don't be astonished by the injustice you see around you. It means don't be dumbfounded by it. Don't be afraid of it. And don't become bitter about it. There's an implication of bitterness there too. Okay, well then, if I'm not supposed to be numb to it, but if it's inevitable, but I'm not supposed to be astonished and I'm not supposed to be bitter about it, what should we do? Well, we can recognize that this is the state of the world. We can understand that this is the world that we live in right now and the world we have to work in and the society we have to mingle about in. And we should remind ourselves constantly that the only way that corrupt human government can really be dealt with in the long term is by Christ Jesus coming and establishing his righteous kingdom on the earth. That's the solve for the problem of human society. It's not a certain system. It's not a certain set of laws, although we love laws and good laws are good things, but we are not going to crack the code. We need a savior to come and rescue humanity from itself, and that is why Christ is going to establish a real and literal kingdom on the earth. Now, in the short term, what we need and what we should be pointed towards when we have the opportunity are godly individuals who are willing to use the authority they have for good rather than for evil. And so in a republic like the United States, when we have a chance to vote and to elect an individual into power, it's important for us to remember that it is not the promises that matter, it is the person that matters. Is this individual a person of integrity, of high character, of godliness, or are they for example, arrogant. That's one of the words that you could use. Another term for when we read high official here, the term can mean, hey, arrogant ones. And some of your translations may even have that. And what the teacher is telling us is that arrogance breeds corruption. It's not going to end up well for us or for our society if our government is full of arrogant people. And so if we want a better society, and we do, then we need more Christ-like leaders. And we need to remind ourselves that the end goal is the Christian kingdom established by Christ after his second coming. Verse 9, the prophet from the land is taken by all and the king is served by the field. So there's very little that you and I can do realistically about who is king. We don't have a king in America. I'm thankful for that. But he's talking about uh, bureaucracy here. He's talking about different levels of government, you know, this official and official above them. And he goes all the way up to the king and he says, hey, this is an issue from the farmer all the way up to the king, this problem of, of everybody trying to grab the same prophet, everybody trying to get for themselves. And so you and I can't do very much about who is the ultimate leader, right? In the sense that your single vote in November will not be the deciding factor. Remember that stupid movie in the early 2000s with Kevin Costner, Swing Vote? And somehow, I never saw it. I watched the trailer on your behalf earlier this week. And somehow, the entire American presidential election literally comes down to one guy's vote, Kevin Costner. And he's like a, a drunk good old boy and everybody's courting him, I guess. I think it had like a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that. <laughs> That's not true. I think it had like a 30%. I'm sorry. I want to speak truthfully. Anyway, that's not going to happen with our individual vote. We aren't going to decide who wields the power in our nation individually. But it's good to vote, and we should. Uh, but what we can do from our heart's perspective, from our attitude's perspective, is to constantly and consistently look to the heavenly king and his coming kingdom. When the perfect king returns to earth, all will be made right. And that's really what we're looking forward to. That's really what we're hanging our hopes on. The government will be on his shoulders, we're told in Isaiah. There will be no need for checks and balances. There will be no need for ethics violation inquiries. There will be no need for impeachment provisions when Christ is king ruling from his throne in Jerusalem because he is our true hope. He is truly righteous. He will rule with a rod of iron and we should hold to that hope while doing our best to promote righteousness right where we are in small and great ways. 
So turning from the horrors of bureaucracy, now the teacher speaks about the personal pursuit of wealth and its dangers. Verse 10, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. In the 1920s, a reporter asked John Rockefeller how much money is enough. His famous reply is one of the most uh, enduring and revealing quotes of all time. His answer was, just a little bit more. But what a great answer. What an honest answer. Uh, How much money is enough? Just a little bit more. Now, at the time, John's net worth was equal to 1% of the entire U.S. economy meaning that if there were 100 John Rockefellers, that would be the whole nation, (laughs) coast to coast. He had all the money in the world. But there in those five words, he perfectly encapsulated the folly of pursuing wealth as an end goal. But he also illustrated how powerfully addictive wealth becomes. In these verses, the teacher warns us about some of the dangerous consequences of a life pursued in wealth. But wealth itself is not the problem, and it's important that we recognize that. In fact, the teacher at the end of this passage is going to tell us that God sometimes gives wealth to some of his people as a gift. So wealth itself is not the problem, a problem. It is not inherently evil on its own. In these verses, we see that it's the love of wealth, the love of silver that is the trouble. And he says so twice in verse 10. Paul the Apostle agrees in his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. When we pursue material success as an end goal of our lives, well, then the consequences are terrible spiritually, relationally, and with all of these other things that the teacher is going to list out. Wealth, we're told here, is hevel, and pursuing it is hevel. Remember what that means. It's, it's the key word for the whole book. It means a puff of smoke that you can't grab onto, and even if you think you've got it in your hands, it just wisps through your fingers. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Sometimes toxic, sometimes just transient, kind of there in front of you, but then it's gone. You can't reliably hold on to it, and, and the reason why you can't reliably hold on to wealth even when you have it. You think, well, here it is. It's, it's not smoke. It's, it's gold doubloons. I have them in my hand, right? But we know that the world is racked by time, death, and chance. And so what is treasure today might be garbage tomorrow, right? But this isn't only a problem that unbelievers deal with. Uh, the teacher speaks to us from the general perspective of a secular humanist, a person who maybe thinks God exists but doesn't really care about having a personal interaction with him. That's the general perspective that he speaks to us. And then every now and then he kind of steps out of that perspective to speak to us as more of a theologian. But this isn't just a problem with unbelievers. Of course, the Pharisees, Luke tells us they were lovers of money. And now the Pharisees are the big bads of the Gospels, of course, right? Right. But the Pharisee party started off in incredible spiritual piety. They were the people at one time we would have wanted to be with their devotion to the word of God and their dedication to following the commands of God. But at some point, they started going off track. And part of the the major part of their problem was that they were lovers of money and it led to many of their heinous sins despite their pious beginnings. Or consider Ananias and Sapphira. I'm not ready to say that Ananias and Sapphira weren't actually Christians. In fact, by all accounts, they seem to be true believers in the church of Jerusalem, and yet they became poisoned by a love of money leading to disastrous results and a very bad Monday for the church. I don't know if it was Monday. Like the teacher, we long for satisfaction, right? It's in our hearts. We want purpose. We want satisfaction. We want a life that matters, The problem is the flesh within us, the old sin nature, and the culture around us tells us, oh, I know the way to satisfaction. I know the way to a meaningful life. I know the way to where you want to go. And often they tell us, our flesh within us, culture around us tells us the way to get there is by pursuing wealth. But it's a lie. Unfortunately, it's a very effective lie. We really want to believe it. But the teacher shows where that way really ends. And remember, 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 he actually knows where this way ends. There was no one in the entire world, maybe the history of the world, that was as wealthy as the teacher, who is King Solomon 
uh, who was not only the wisest man to ever live, but also probably one of the wealthiest men to ever live. Verse 11, when good things increase, the ones who consume them multiply. What then is the profit to the owner except to gaze at them with his eyes? Christopher Wallace, the late 20th century philosopher poet, famously declared, Mo money, mo problems. I don't think the teacher was a fan of Notorious B.I.G., but on this he would agree. That's exactly what he's saying. The more money you have, the more problems you're going to have. Wealth promises to solve all of our problems, and it seems to make sense to us. We think, that sounds about right. I'd be able to solve my problems with wealth. And don't get me wrong. Money can help in a lot of wonderful ways, but the truth of the matter is wealth ends up bringing an infestation of new troubles with it. That's what the teacher says. Here in verse 11, he says, hey, it comes with it sort of a plague of leeches that tags along to see what they can take from the pile. We see examples of this prominently when uh, young athletes start getting those big paychecks. They sign these multi-million dollar contracts, they start getting paid, and, and we've all heard this story before. We've all seen it depicted both uh, in real life and in Hollywood. The family comes out of the woodwork for constant handouts. Suddenly, a large staff is needed to handle the business, maintain the brand, develop new you know, connections, all this stuff. Of course, there are ever-increasing taxes to be paid. The government wants more and more of their share. And so there's the owner, right, in verse 11 the person who actually earned the wealth, but he's crowded out from his own table and can only look on as others devour what he's earned. Verse 12, the sleep of the worker is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich permits him no sleep. Michael Jackson was a record holder many times over. One of the records he held was that he was the youngest vocalist ever to top the Billboard Hot 100 at like 11 years old. He set another record, sadly. Experts say he may be the only human being ever to go 60 days without REM sleep. If you know anything about the end of Michael Jackson's life, he wasn't sleeping, he was having all of these problems, and so his doctor was like giving him these crazy sedative tranquilizer anesthetics to put him to sleep. The problem is his body went to sleep, but his brain would not enter REM sleep. And ultimately, he ended up overdosing on those drugs. But, you know, uh, sleep experts that have studied this say that had he not died of that overdose of the drugs, they said, hey, he would have died just a few days later because no one has ever gone 60 days without REM sleep. Your brain can't handle it. It will start to shut down. Uh, very sad. From the world's perspective... Michael Jackson had it all, wealth, fame, his place in the history books, palaces, every comfort he could possibly want or imagine. He was the king of pop, right? But he couldn't get a single night's rest. What a sad, sad story. Whether it's because they're, you know, in verse 12 here, they're worried about their wealth and how to protect it or because they've overindulged in some way and they're having tummy trouble or because they just don't know when to stop. They just keep working for more and more and more. The pursuers of wealth in verse 12, they struggle to slumber to their own hurt. Meanwhile, the not so rich laborer is rolling in rest. Verse 13, there's a sickening tragedy I've seen under the sun. Wealth kept by its owner to his harm. So here we have a fellow uh, who went on a hunt for wealth. He dedicated his life to it, and he got it. Not necessarily in a bad way, not necessarily at the expense of others. He, he got it. He built his fortune. But then, rather than that treasure helping him, benefiting him, improving him, it harmed him. It warped his character. It changed him into a different person. We see this lived out most obviously and embarrassingly, usually with young celebrities, the child stars, right? They become suddenly famous and wealthy. You, I'm sure you can think of one or two from any era. How many of them turn into better people when that happens? How do those stories end? These days they end on TMZ, if you know what that is. And it's never like, here's a TMZ video of this child star building a children's hospital. Uh, it's never, that's never the end of the story. Money promises to make everything better, but so often it does the opposite and works miserable mischief in a life. That's what the teacher's trying to tell us. Verse 14, that wealth was lost in a bad venture, so when he fathered a son, he was empty-handed. When the king of pop died, 
he was $500 million in debt. Michael Jackson spent decades making hundreds of millions of dollars. And when he stepped into eternity, he owed more money than the average American could possibly make in 250 lifetimes. It's crazy. Now, luckily for his heirs, his estate still makes money, and I'm sure they are taken care of or whatever, but it's a, it's a perfect example of what the teacher is talking about. This person who has it all, all the wealth, all the fame, all of the prominence, all the everything, a person who's seen as a, an idol to people, someone to emulate, someone who has it all, and yet he can't get a good night's sleep, and he is half a billion dollars in debt. In the case of verse 14, maybe it wasn't even the, the owner's fault that he lost the money. Maybe he didn't lose it all on the ponies. Maybe he didn't do something wrong or foolish. Maybe he just made all the right financial decisions, but he lived during an economic downturn like 1929 or 2008. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's his fault, but maybe it wasn't his fault. It doesn't matter. It was all gone. The, what his fault was, was that his hope his life was wrapped up in his portfolio, and that is futility. That's not going to last. What he planned to leave his son was not truth or faith or hope that lasts or eternal purpose or something greater than himself. What he hoped to leave his son, he put all of his eggs in this one basket, and that was worldly buying power. Uh, this is my goal, that m make sure my kids have money when I die so that they can have money. And then he wakes up one day at the end of his life and the bubble has burst and he has lost everything. It all disappeared in a puff of smoke. So maybe the economic downturn wasn't his fault, but the pursuit, the, the goal, the orientation of his life, that was his fault. He could have built his life around something that lasts. He could have handed off to his children, not uh, banknotes, but uh, handed off to them truth and eternal purpose and a life dedicated to God who loves them and who gave them life. Verse 15, as he came from his mother's womb, so he will go again naked as he came he will take nothing for all his efforts that he can carry in his hands. This too is a sickening tragedy. Exactly as he comes, so he will go. What does the one gain who struggles for the wind? So last week, if you were here, the teacher asked us a hard question, and it was, why are you going to church? We talked about that. Tonight, the question is, okay, what are you working for? What am I working for? Now, don't misunderstand. The Bible commands us to work and to provide for our families it commands us even to save in many cases and to give financially to the work of God. But as we live life, as we work a job, as we make investments, the question that is presented before us by God's word and we should present to ourselves is, okay, what am I working for? What is my end goal? What am I aiming at? And we want to keep in mind this truth that we just read. Naked I came, naked I go. It's not just something that the teacher had to say in Ecclesiastes. Job repeats this truth. And Paul also repeats this truth again in 1 Timothy. There's a lot of Ecclesiastes in the letter 1 Timothy that Paul wrote, which is surprising to me. But he says to Timothy, he says, we brought nothing into this world and we bring nothing with us out of it. And that's absolutely true. How sad when you hear about these people who are like, I was buried with my Ferrari or the, the pharaohs. They were buried with all of their, their treasure and in some weird cases buried with their servants too. I guess your life doesn't matter. I'll need servants in the afterlife. They're not going with you. you. We don't take anything with us. Now, of course, what the Bible does reveal is that we can send things ahead of us. This is a, a remarkable grace, a thing that God has done on our behalf. We can send eternal investments ahead that will not depreciate. The Lord says, I got, it, I got it covered. No bubbles burst in heaven. There's no depreciation. There's no robbers. There's no moths. There's no rust. I will take care of it. And in fact, when you invest into the work of the kingdom, I will extra reward it. It's like when you open a new bank account. Sometimes they say, hey, if you... If you, you know, if you open an account with this much money, we will match it. Or we'll, if you do direct deposit, we'll give you this much extra every now and then. And the Lord's like, I'm just going to keep putting stuff into your account. You don't really deserve it, but I want to give it. And so we can send things ahead 
into eternity, even though we don't take anything with us when we die. And we do that by serving the Lord and giving to the Lord and obeying the Lord as he leads us in this life and honoring him with our devotion. But we do want to keep the proper perspective. Because as Paul explains, when we give in to the natural human desire to be rich and to seek after that life, Paul says, it plunges us into ruin and destruction. And by craving wealth, some Christians wander away from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. So he sounds a lot like the teacher, only he's speaking very directly, not just to people in general, but directly to Christians. He says, hey, let's be careful about this. Let's keep a proper attitude and mindset as we move through life, working, investing, and, uh, and, 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 and building a human life centered on Christ and his truth. Today, many of the wealthiest Americans are trying crazy schemes to live forever, all these health treatments, or they're getting into cryogenic freezing, or you know, they're talking about uploading their consciousness into a computer or whatever. They're trying to live forever, to put off death so they can keep all of their stuff, but it's not going to work. No matter how rich or poor you are, every single one of us has a date with death and eternity on the other side. And so work for eternity, even as you're working here on the earth. Verse 17, what is more, he eats in darkness all his days with much frustration, sickness, and anger. So darkness here can speak of isolation. It's said that William Randolph Hearst ended his days not in the warm embrace of a loving family or throngs of followers, but sitting in the basement of his great castle, just watching the same movies over and over and over again. Who's been to Hearst Castle? Fantastic place. Uh, it's awesome to go and see what's possible to build. And then when you start learning about the man, you see the ruin, you see the, the emptiness, you see the isolation, you see a person who, from the world's perspective, had everything and yet was utterly alone, utterly ruined, utterly empty. The, the movie Citizen Kane is based, if you're familiar with that, the whole point is that you have the guy, Kane, and he is you know, super wealthy and you know, powerful and he does all of these things and he ends his life just crying out for his beloved rosebud sled. Completely dissatisfied, completely unhappy, completely empty. And Citizen Kane was based off of William Randolph Hearst. And William Randolph Hearst was not happy about it. <laughs> We just don't want to believe it's true though, right? It's human nature for us to think, well, yes, Michael Jackson, and yes, William Randolph Hearst, and yes, John Rockefeller, and yes, all of these other examples again and again and again, but we just don't want to believe it's true. It might work for us, but how much more proof do we need? Again, this is not about wealth itself. It's about the inclination of our hearts. It's about the navigation of our lives. It's about our focus. It's about our desire. It's about what we're going after. We should believe the person and the people who have taken the trail before us. And the teacher took the trail before us. And he points to other people who have taken the trail before us. And he says, look where these people end up. He invites us to see the realities, not just trust in the fantasies. Verse 18, here's what I've seen to be good. It's appropriate to eat, drink, and experience good in all the labor one does under the sun during the few days of his life God has given him because that is his reward. Okay, so the answer is not, well, everybody should just quit their job and go live in a monastery somewhere and just chant. That's all God wants his people to do. Not at all. In fact, we've already seen in earlier passages how important and how God-given your individual work is. Uh, for those of you who are believers, unless something has gone very wrong and you have ignored God's leadings, you should have a pretty good confidence that your job, whether you think it is super important or super menial, your job is something God has given you to glorify him and to bless you and to bless others around you. God says that every job is important and he wants you to enjoy it. And so from Hevel here, the first you know, section from 8 to 17, that's all Hevel, but now we turn to hope. Once again, the teacher's going to give us a little glimpse into the good life. Don't we want that? I want to live the good life. And the teacher wants us to live the good life too, the better life. He says, this is what's good. This is what's better. This is what's really worth it. This is really what you're aiming at, living with contentment in the life and purposes God has for you. And he wants you, 
he said God he says God wants you to enjoy your life even in small delights along the way. Now, of course, suffering and difficulty and trial and sorrow, those are still part of life. The teacher's not suggesting that we're not going to have a hard time. We are, obviously. Not everything we experience is enjoyable. Okay, got that out of the way. But generally speaking, as you live out your daily life in the home, at school, in your workplace, God wants you to feel contented, to feel satisfied, to feel that your life has purpose, and to enjoy even simple things throughout the day like food and drink. Who here has had a cotton candy grape? They had those at Costco? My goodness, if you haven't had, I don't even like grapes. If you haven't had a cotton candy grape, get yourself a box of cotton candy grapes. They're grapes that taste like cotton candy. Now, admittedly, I love cotton candy, but these grapes are so good. They're so good. And you know what? God wants them to be so good to us. Or substitute whatever your cotton candy grapes are. Right? How about just regular cotton candy? If you can eat cotton candy and and it's okay for you, then, man, the Lord actually wants you to enjoy it. God created a world where you can and he wants you to experience wonderful enjoyment even if you're not rich. Enjoy that cup of coffee. Relish that warm and filling buttery biscuit. That's why God gave us tongues and flavors and spices and herbs and things like that because he wants you to enjoy. You realize like cows just eat grass, that's it, right? Or my dog, my dog will eat whatever. Whether it's good or bad or anything, if she thinks it's food, she's like, I guess I'll eat it. And I think, oh, this is horrible. But God looks at you as a human being. He's like, I gave you tongue with, with sense, the ability to, to taste different flavors. And I gave all of these different flavors. And I gave all these spices. And I gave all these ways of preparing things. You can take the same food and prepare it all these different ways. And it tastes all these, in all these wonderful ways. And he wants you to enjoy it, even if you're not rich. You don't have to fly to New York City and spend $1,000 on the Golden Opulent Sunday. It's a, it was a real dessert that had 23 karat gold leaf and you would eat it. I'm sure it's fine. Heavy metal poisoning is great. But God has scattered enjoyments all around your regular life. And not just in what we eat, of course, but that's the illustration. That's the, uh, the item that the teacher's pointing at. As his people, aside from being led by him and obeying him and drawing near to him, we also have the opportunity to sort of live out a continual scavenger hunt where we discover God's many gifts hidden in everyday life. The beauty of music, the beauty of melody, the beauty of that really great cup of coffee, like I said. Paul says, again, 1 Timothy, that God richly provides us with all things to enjoy. What a good life. The point of these three closing verses is that God does not want us to live in a perpetual state of worry or fear or bitterness or agitation. His desire is that we live in a perpetual state of contented joy. Verse 19, furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has allowed him to enjoy them. Take his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God. So there it is, black and white. It is not evil for Christians to be rich. And I think sometimes we just need that reminder. God gives wealth to some Christians, and that is a very good thing in many ways. Recently, I was talking to a representative of Gospel for Asia, and he was telling me this story about how they have felt a desire to move and start working in Africa, right? And that there was this place in Africa that would kept calling them and saying, will you please build a hospital here in Africa? And they said, that sounds great, but man, hospitals are expensive. And so they were doing research on how much it would cost. And they said, yeah, we, we can't do it. And so later, this same guy was talking to another Christian brother. And he said, hey, I heard you guys are going to Africa, right? Yeah. And I heard a rumor that you guys are going to build a hospital, right? And he said, eh, they want us to build a hospital, but it's a lot of money. And the guy said, how much money is it? And he said, we need $3 million. And he said, here's the check. Boom. What? Like he wrote the check. Just He didn't know anything about it. He just wrote the check. $3 million gave it. And now they're building a hospital in Africa to bring the gospel there. 
you tell me it's a bad thing for a Christian to be wealthy? Not if God gave the wealth. Not if God directed that person. It's not wrong for believers to be wealthy. The question is how they got there and what their purpose is and if they're walking with the Lord in their life. The difference is Abraham and Lot. Both of those were righteous men, according to the New Testament. Both of them were wealthy, but one of them was wealthy because God did it for him, and the other was wealthy because he took it for himself. And we see the very different end to their stories, right? And so that's, that's the deal. And so we want to be like Abraham, but we want to be careful that we're not living like Lot, but thinking we're Abraham. That's the deal. Verse 20 for he does not often consider the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Another way of saying this is that God keeps a person busy with joy. As we live, God's intention for us is that we be preoccupied by joy. C.S. Lewis has a great book you should read called Surprised by Joy. And he could write a sequel from this passage, Preoccupied by Joy. Even when there's injustice, even when I'm beset by the futility of life, even when the stock market crashes, God's desire for us is heavenly joy. And when we lay hold of this generous gift from God, a life full of joy, well, the teacher declares that we will never look back on our lives with disappointment. In fact, we'll be so busy with the Lord's joy that we won't worry about those things behind us at all. The language can even indicate that God will keep us singing with joy. Two roads, two ways of pursuing life. Both make big promises. Both ways say, come this way to experience the good life. And we've seen over and over what people look like at the end of each of those trails. One is left isolated, empty, cheated by leeches, burdened by taxes, at the mercy of economic forces he cannot control. The other is left at a heavenly table where God himself, the richest of all, has invited us to receive all of the fullness that we could ever want with a cup running over and a happy heart along the way and an always appreciating eternal reward that cannot be downgraded or depleted. These are the two wet ways. So choose wisely. 